Welcome to Dental Business Rx. Practice success in 30 minutes or less. Thank you for calling ABC Dental. This is part two of a two-part series on recession-proofing your practice. Now, there's a lot of talk right now as to whether we're in a recession or not in a recession or going into a recession. Regardless of all that, there are certain things that you want to do in your practice to ensure that you not only weather the economic storm or survive, but that you can actually thrive despite it. Now, in last week's episode, part one, I was joined by Sabri Bloomberg, the Deputy Chief Operating Officer here at MGE. Sabri is responsible for all of MGE's technical delivery. And Sabri had created a checklist, a recession-proofing checklist, which is available to download, by the way, on the episode webpage. It's really cool. And she started to get into sort of these seven points that you want to take a look at in your practice, that you want to make sure are really sharp to make sure that your practice is robust enough to be successful during any times of economic uncertainty. So I've got Sabri back with me this week. Sabri, are you all hooked up over there? I'm ready to go. Okay, good. And I think we just jump right in because we have a lot to cover. Yes. In last week's episode, we covered uh, two of the seven points. And the first one had to do with new patients, if you missed it. And the second one had to do with procedural blend and profitability. Now, I have this cheat sheet here. Sabri has these seven points listed out. Uh, the third one you have listed here is the hygiene area. Yeah. Okay. Now, obviously, we've talked about how hygiene is important. We go over to the MGE program in, sure. in our online platform, DDS Success. But as far as recession proving, what am I going to focus on with my hygiene area? Okay. Well, the first thing is to understand why hygiene is on this checklist. Okay. And it's on the checklist for two reasons. Mm -hmm. One, because obviously it's a source of revenue mm -hmm. in the practice and should be about a third of your overall production should be hygiene production mm -hmm. uh, per month. Sure. Right. So um, there's income associated with this this area. And the second thing is all the sales uh, or potential sales that you could be getting out of hygiene uh, that are going to fill the doctor's schedule. Okay. So 60% uh, of a doctor's charts uh, in the United States uh, have outstanding treatment in them. And um, most of these patients you're going to be seeing because they are coming back through hygiene. Sure. And that's the reason why hygiene is such an important part, not just of a dental practice. It really is the foundation of your dental practice. And we talked about this last time. Unless you want to be new patient dependent, mm -hmm. which means that you are going to be starting your practice from scratch. But pretty much every month then at that point. Exactly, yeah. because you're only focusing on your new patients. Uh, if you don't want to get into that kind of situation, you must focus on your existing patients. Mm -hmm. So that gives you two options. One, you can have your receptionist try to sell that treatment over the phone by reaching out to patients with outstanding treatment. Which never works. No. If you couldn't close it in person, the chances that somebody's going to sell it over the phone are slim to none. Sure. Right? Would also be weird. Yeah, yeah, it is. Like, yeah. are you ready to do that mm -hmm. crown yet? No, right. I'm not. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So it's just, and you know, yeah, you get some success off of that, but generally it's it's not as, um, for the amount of effort you're exerting uh, versus the return that you get, it's much easier to get these patients just back on the hygiene schedule and... Um, and then when you're face to face with them, sell them the treatment that they need. Okay. So, um, so most of the doctor's schedule should be being filled with existing patients now having um, uh, accepted their treatment and doing their treatment. So that's why we need a busy hygiene area. Yes. Okay. So now, as far as recession proofing goes, yes. What am I? What am I looking at here? You're focusing on two different areas. You're focusing on hygiene compliance, mm -hmm. getting that hygiene compliance up to eighty percent. Okay. Um, and um, you know, there's different ways to do that. If your hygiene compliance is not eighty percent, which, quite frankly, um, I mean, I have spoken to five or six thousand dentists over the last years, mm -hmm. and I've never seen somebody who came in with an eighty percent compliance. What do you normally say? If I would say 35%, I'd be being generous. So it's then when you see somebody who's higher... Oh, sorry, I cut you off. No, there. no, it's fine. When you see somebody over 35, that's an outlier. Yes. Got it. That, so now just to... If, if you don't mind me elaborating, yeah. I'm being um, Mr. Mr. Butt in here today. Yeah, I'm butting in. Go for it. Well, I just want to make sure because we've talked about this before, but the, the hygiene compliance concept yeah. is uh, what percentage of your patients are regularly showing up for their hygiene visits. Correct. So you're saying if a, if a doctor has 1,000 charts or 2,000 charts, the yeah. average you're seeing is 700 of those patients are regularly 
showing up for hygiene. That's correct. Yeah, I mean, that's terrible. That is terrible. And then what they have to do is they have to focus on all these new patients to um, to make up for the patients that they're losing because they're not keeping them compliant. Sure. It's really uh, a silly business model. It's expensive, and it just makes it difficult on everybody. Just keep the patients you have. Right. And if, pe- if folks want to check their hygiene compliance, yeah. we do have that downloadable hygiene formula. It's a little spreadsheet they yeah. can use. Um, we'll put it on the episode webpage if yeah. you want to check it out. But definitely, we recommend that they do that. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think you also have a whole episode that you dedicated to hygiene. Yeah, we did. Right? We did. And I recommend they listen to that on how to get your compliance up and the actions necessary in order to get that 80% compliance. See, now you have me in a spot. I forget the episode number. So it's <laughs> it was on hygiene. I'm sure they can look it, it up. has the word hygiene in it. Right. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> it won't be hard to find. Exactly. So uh, we wanted to focus on two areas. The first one was compliance. Yeah. And then the second point is productivity of the hygienists themselves. Okay. So uh, how do you gauge your productivity, right? Mm-hmm. Well, um, the national average in the United States, if a, um, a practice is 100% PPO, mm-hmm. a, uh, a hygienist is going to produce anywhere from 12 to 1500 a day, depending on where that practice is located, because the fees change for sure. PPOs, right? Of course. So, so wait, let me stop you there. So yeah. 12 to 1500 a day yeah. for a PPO hygienist. Well, the hygienist isn't PPO, but all these patients are in a PPO. So yes. I'm taking a reduced fee. That hygienist should still be doing 12 to 1500 a day. Correct. Okay. So that's the point I'm gauging against. Correct. I that's see. the national average. That right. means if you're just doing the usual, you should be doing anywhere between twelve and fifteen hundred a day. All right. Now, if you're not, right, what is what is happening there is. Um, Either you have such low compliance that only your patients who are super compliant are showing up in hygiene, and usually the only thing they need is a cleaning. They don't need scaling or limited scaling or gross debridements or whatever else the hygienist can do, right? And that's an important point is that the hygienist is actually using all of their skills. Mm -hmm. All the things that they are legally allowed to do in your state, they should be using those tools. And then obviously that is going to lower your overall production because you're not um, getting uh, other things that would augment that production, right? And then the second thing is, that's going to lower that production is if the patient does need treatment, mm-hmm. um, and for example, the patient does need a gross debridement, um, usually what would happen if if the hygienist, um, listen, like just like what happens with the doctor, mm-hmm. like a doctor usually comes out of school just like a hygienist comes out of school, and they're all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, sure. and they want to uh, use all of their skills, and they really want to help patients, mm-hmm. and uh, they have this idea that whatever they present or tell patients to do, they're just going to magically do. Mm-hmm. And uh, the problem is, is then they've been out of school for a couple of years, and they've kind of been beaten up by the patients or beaten down sure. <laughs> by patients sure. who, you know, what is my insurance cover and my insurance doesn't cover that and I don't want to pay anything extra or I don't want to take x-rays or whatever they have to handle that they're having trouble handling after a while it gets easier to just do it without charging for it so you're and saying to get hassled by the patient patient needs a gross to bribe them, yeah and then they go I just you know, it's a it's a cleaning yeah so they're not charging for that glow host deprivement separate from a profi correct or they're not doing like like, like the a couple of teeth need scaling mm-hmm. right okay well you should be charging for that sure. uh, but they don't they just scale it and call it a day got it right um, the the problem with that is twofold the first one is um, obviously the lost productivity, Mm -hmm. but more importantly, uh, there's no accountability on the patient's part. If you were to just charge the patient for it and let them know, listen, uh, because you haven't been showing up on time and uh, maybe get a little bit better educated in home care, um, we have to kind of get you back to zero now. Got it. Right? And like that the patient understands, they have some... uh, uh, responsibility in being the situation that they're in. But if we clean it up now, then in the future, they don't have to do that again. Makes sense. Right? And maybe they'll be more compliant and maybe they'll have better home care. So it's not good for anybody. It's not good for the practice. It's not good for the patient to not get them to um, 
to get the work that they need and, and be charged for it. They Makes need, sense. They need to pay for it. Makes sense. So that, those are the things that are going to lower your productivity. So as a doctor, uh, you do have the responsibility of making sure that your hygienist understands your treatment protocol and that that's actually in writing. Mm -hmm. And you have the responsibility of making sure that the hygienist understands how you want to charge for it. Got it. Right. And, and that's it. And just those couple of little things will improve your hygiene. All right. So that makes sense. Those, yes. are, the, those are the areas we're going to put our focus on with hygiene. Yeah? Correct. Productivity and sales. Perfect. Okay. So that's point three, your hygiene area. And we get to point four, which is you have listed here as getting out of PPOs, managed care, and reduced fee plans. Yes. All right, so now it was interesting because when you're giving the example of a hygienist, a PPO high or not a PPO hygienist, 100 percent practice is PPO hygienist should be doing twelve to fifteen hundred. Yes. So then, if you're dumping PPOs, yes, what would that average become? Just out of curiosity, whatever's normally in your area. So the average becomes usually anywhere between eighteen hundred, but I've seen it all the way up to three thousand a day, depending on the fees, the philosophy of the practice, because it basically gives you carte blanche mm -hmm. to do whatever you feel is best for the patient right. and charge what you think is worth it. And it does that for every other procedure in the practice. That's too. exactly right. So now I know we've talked about this. I, I beat on this very heavily. Yes. Getting out PPOs and managed care. I know you've helped a lot of our clients navigate through this. Yes. Um, and you know we have a whole episode on dropping PPOs. I'm probably sure. going to do another one just because it's definitely something that's getting a lot of traction with folks now. And becoming critical now. Now that's an interesting thing you say, critical. Yes. In a sense of, so if I'm facing a situation where profitability is at a premium and things like this, because yes. you know, salaries have gone up, everything's gone yes. up. Yes. And, you know, economic uncertainty looms, so to speak, yes. you know, where it's a little bit more difficult, then it's more important that I'm getting 1400 for that crown than the 1800 because 1400 is what I should be getting. That's correct. Yeah. So now- as far as doing this, because obviously we could we could spend three hours. We've done whole live streams for two hours about getting out of PPOs. Yes. What would you say, like if if, if someone's out there listening, yes. and they go, well, I want to get out of PPOs, what would be their first step? What would you have them do? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to break down your, um, your patient base mm -hmm. by uh, types of PPO, mm -hmm. compensation for that PPO, All right. and how many patients you have so participating with that particular plan. Patients. Types and compensation. Correct. And we do have a spreadsheet for this. You know, the one yes. we made, the insurance plan analyzer, which again, I know we got a lot of downloads in this episode, but I'll put it up there. Yeah. So now, so I, let's say I do those things. Yeah. Types, uh, number of patients and uh, compensation. Right? Yes. Right. I break, I hope I mentioned those three things again. Yeah. Properly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little off cuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I do that, and now I want to figure out, like, wh what do I do next? Okay, so the, the you have to have a couple of things in place okay. in order to get out of PPOs. Uh, the first thing is that you have to have high uh, compliance uh, in your hygiene. So I, you would get the hygiene compliance sorted out before you start dropping the PPO. So there's usually a couple of things that I do to kind of lay the groundwork. Mm -hmm. I make sure that, that that practice is getting new patients, um, not just from marketing, mm -hmm. but also from internal referrals, okay. right? The quote unquote free new patients. Uh, I would make sure that the staff is trained on how to handle patient questions if they're out of PPO. So that's sure. when the phone's being answered, like, do you take my insurance debt? Uh, the, whoever's answering the phone doesn't just say, no, we don't, sure. and lose that because you are taking you're just it. You just, people up. Well, yeah, yeah. They, you, they can still come there. Yeah, they can yeah. absolutely still come there. And, um, I, you know, there's some, there's some other things. And as I said, we, we do go over these. Hygiene compliance becomes very important. Doctor's sure. ability to sell becomes very important. All those things become important. Um, and then gauging that against that list that you made in the beginning, there might be a few PPOs that you look at right away that you can go, I can just get rid of these because the compensation's so bad or so few of these patients just get rid of these. Well, I guess that's really the tell. Yeah. Um, and that's why we have that spreadsheet. Yeah. Because I might enter or let's say I take a PPO that's a large portion of my practice. Yeah. You know, it's 30% of my practice. Yeah. And the, but the fees are so bad. Yeah, I entered in that little spreadsheet. Yeah, and then it comes out that because that that spreadsheet also tells you how many patients you could afford to lose. That's exactly right. Right, and I might find out that you know I could lose fifty percent of these patients and not lose a penny in revenue. That's correct. And yep. even when you're dropping an insurance like Delta, which is probably the most traumatic one to drop, yeah, you're not going to lose more than thirty percent of the patients. The other seventy percent of those patients you will retain in the practice. And you've seen that play at University. Oh God, yeah. Yeah. Like time after time after, I mean, even when the person is taking an HMO or Medicaid, where really they have to change insurance sure. in order, or providers in order to get any kind of benefits whatsoever, 
they still retain a large amount. Well, like what percentage of, those of an HMO or a Medicaid would a person retain? Well, Medicaid becomes a little bit more uh, tricky, mm-hmm. right? Because it, then it depends on whether you have a pedo practice and things like that. So it, this is modified by different sure, factors. Sure. And we've had pedodontists that have dropped Medicaid entirely. Yes, yeah. we have. And even they survived, believe it yeah, or not. Exactly, yeah. um, and they're much better for it. Sure. So, um, so it really depends. I mean, usually those numbers go up to like 50% at that point. Like when you're hitting an HMO or something. Correct. Correct, yeah. correct. But uh, the point is not to be scared on um, am I going to have a practice left or the work that goes into going into a fee-for-service practice. The thing that I would be scared about is being controlled, having the destiny of my business controlled by an outside factor. Right. And that's the problem with managed care. You can no longer control your profitability because we saw happen, what we saw happen in the last year and a half is as inflation is 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 uh, becoming more and more of a situation sure. with wages and increased supply costs and all the things that you're paying for ordinarily. So your overheads come going up, right? The the insurance companies that you are contracted with are lowering your fees, and sure. there's nothing you can do about it. So you end up working your butt off for very little productivity. And in certain cases, I was talking to a doctor in the Carolinas um, uh, last year mm-hmm. that is producing a hundred thousand a month. Mm-hmm. Right, a hundred percent PPL. Yeah, um, you would think a hundred thousand a month—that's a healthy practice. Sure, their profitability, his profitability—he was literally not taking a paycheck because of it. His only solution is you must get out of PPOs, and this is only getting worse. Now I have a question. So yeah. just not to digress, but yeah. so he was producing a hundred. Was he collecting a hundred? Was it were those adjusted PPO That's fees? That's adjusted PPO fees. He was collecting a hundred. So his so he's collecting a hundred. Yes. All right. So he's producing a hundred at the PPO fees. So he's collecting a hundred. So his co- collection percentage is good. Yes. Did you ever look at? I don't know if you remember this or not, because I know this is a year ago, right? Mm-hmm. But the uh, what his unadjusted production would have been? Yeah, it was closer to one sixty. Wow. Yes. So this is a single practitioner with hygienists, two hygienists. So his hygiene was actually healthy, mm-hmm. right? So I have a healthy hygiene. I have got good new patients. Mm-hmm. I've got enough space. I've got a very productive, competent doctor mm-hmm. doing regular bread and butter dentistry, right? right? No, you know, th- just normal. Mm-hmm. Um, that by all, in all, you know, from every from every angle that you look at this, this person should have had a comfortable business and a comfortable life. Not making any money. Sorry, I just was doing some math. As I know, you're I saw you there. doing yeah. it. So he was writing off 37.5%. Yeah, but that's not unusual. No, I know. So, 30, so if you look at it for a second, he's writing off, he's producing 160 collect, and collecting 100. Yes. Really, if we're looking at it, because those numbers don't seem to get tracked anymore. Because you remember back in the mid 2000s, because uh, that's when we started, we're, really, we started to see PPOs grab more and more ground in the late 90s and yes. the mid 2000s. But you would talk to a doctor who's in a lot of PPOs in, let's say, 2003 or four. Mm-hmm. And they would still keep track of adjusted versus unadjusted production, Correct. right? I don't know if they didn't get around to entering the fee schedules or whatever. Yeah. So you would see this huge disparity. Yeah. And you could just figure out oh, yeah, they've, they've got – either their – whoever's doing their collections is terrible yeah. or they have a lot of managed care. Yeah. So this doctor is producing 160, collecting 100. So in essence, writing off 37.5% of what he's producing, even though his supply costs, employee costs, all these things have gone up. Yeah. And they still don't change because he's working on PPO patients. Yeah. So then theoretically, mm-hmm. if he were to drop his PPOs, this is a 37.5% write-off on his fees, mm-hmm. he'd probably be able to lose I, – I don't have my spreadsheet in front of me, but if he lost 30, 40, maybe even – gosh, I don't Half know. Half his patients. His patients and did work less, mm-hmm. he'd still collect that 100000 at full fee. Correct, yeah. because he would need less staff. He mm-hmm. would need less supplies. He would need less of everything. Right. So automatically, even if he lost half his practice – his profitability would go way up. So th- this ranks high. But and in, in general, this ranks super high right now. It really does because ultimately what you need when you go into an environment that is um, – not on automatic. Things aren't normal, mm-hmm. right? If you go, you want more and more control. You need more control. Right. When you take a look at each one of these points we're going over, you need to control this. You need right. to control this. You need to control well, this. Well, and you started last week's preview, if you missed last week, you started off with the ability they had to be able to pivot quickly. That's correct. And change with if environmental conditions change. But if you can't change your fees. Right. Yeah. Wow. Right. That is terrible, isn't it? It is. It, it is. And, um, and I, I just want to stress, and I stress this, and every time we talk about this, 
um, that uh, dentists have gotten the, the mindset, maybe from other dentists, I'm not sure where they're getting it from, but this message is really banged into their head mm -hmm. that you cannot survive in a dental practice unless you take ma managed care. And I'm telling you now, you cannot survive dentistry if you take managed care. Well, we've seen lots of folks who do survive well without taking any managed care. Correct. But I've also seen a lot of guys not surviving because they're taking managed care. Well, you just so, talked about one, yeah. Yes. Right so I would really I would really like to. And and you know, it's not as difficult as you think and it is. Let me ask you one more thing about yeah. this. So let's say, I mean, because people are going to be in any variation of mix in their practice as far as blend, you know, number of PPOs, types of PPOs, et cetera. Sure. Is this something that if someone goes, you know, look, I, I seriously want to get out of these things. Yes. Is this something you would say, well, sure, do it on your own? Oh, like um, building an Ikea dresser or something, or is this something you suggest that they actually get some professional assistance with? I would definitely suggest you get professional assistance for two reasons, mitigating risk, right? And also mental support, <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. Listen, I've seen people mm -hmm. get all gung ho where where you tell them to get out of like managed care, and sure. they get all gung ho and drop everything immediately. Yeah, right, all of it at once. When usually this is done gradiently. I see. And even the guys who dropped everything and really did it in the worst possible way that you can do this survived better than they did with the managed but care. But it was stressful. Yeah, you, 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 you want some guidance so you can do it gradiently, so you can make it pretty. It's easy for your staff. It's sure. easy for your patients. Easy on yourself mentally. Everybody's on the same page. Exactly. Like I think of one, I was talking to one client's front desk and I guess they, they had gotten gung ho and had dropped all the plans. Yes. And the patients found out when they showed up. Right. But like, hey, how you doing? Practice. Oh, by the way, they still were fine. Yeah. But you know, then you have your you're subjecting your your receptionist to having to deal with some of the you know irate patients after they I think they were finding out after the procedure in Correct. certain cases, which obviously it's not what we recommend. No. But uh, yeah, there's a way to do this and way not to do this. If you do want professional assistance with this, uh, what we recommend you can go to the downloads page, you can download the insurance plan analyzer, and you can request a consultation. Uh, where we'll do that with you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. So there's that one. That's number four. Number five. Yeah. Um, now, this was kind of a longer one, but it, we, we, I know you kind of grouped them. Yeah. It, it's more expanded on the checklist. Correct. That they can download. But it had to do, number one, you said they had to have a fully functioning office manager and you wanted their team effectively trained with good organizational systems. Correct. That was kind of the upshot of what you'd said. Yes. Right? So – Again, you know, in, in we don't want to have unlimited time, unfortunately, because I know you could talk, you do talk about this for hours and hours, and you teach people quite a few things about this. What would you have somebody focus on right here? Okay, first thing is is you need an office manager, mm -hmm. right? And what do I mean when I say office manager? I mean somebody who is running your organization, mm -hmm. right? That understands how to expand your organization and how to keep it profitable. Okay, so this right. is a real executive. Yeah, an executive, not somebody who understands the systems of dentistry per se. They need to understand the well, systems. Of course. Like how do you schedule? How do you file of insurances? Course. How do you, you know? Of course, they need to know those things. But more importantly, they understand how to handle and expand a, bis a business mm -hmm. uh, efficiently and uh, effectively. Okay. So um, you need a, that's where you start. You need an office manager because they will put your team together mm -hmm. and they will train your team. And they will coordinate your team and utilize the resources of the business properly so that your overhead doesn't go out of control and so that you expand smoothly. Okay. Now, because when we say get out of PPOs, who's going to do this? The doctor? Right. They're chair side. Yeah. That's not going to work. No. Who's going to fix the hygiene? The doctor? Yeah. It's going to be the office manager. It, it, the office manager is a critical piece and the correct office manager is a critical piece. It also keeps your team focused. Well, it's interesting because we've had... Um, as this has evolved over the years, the yes. various iterations of the MGE Power Program, yeah, right. It, it started initially, yeah, primarily as training. Well, actually, there was some training for the doc and training for the OM. Yes, that didn't work. The doc and the OM had to be both schooled in the same. Correct, and thing. they had to be t work hand in hand. Right, and then we'll sometimes see folks who don't want to train an OM; they mm -hmm. just want to be trained themselves. Yes, that doesn't work. Nope. So the MGE Power Program that you know everybody hears about yeah. is training for both the doctor. And the office manager, and we don't consider that somebody's really effectively done the power program unless they at least have an office manager who's effective and in training. That's correct. You forgot one scenario, and that is we train the office manager and not the doctor. That doesn't work either. That's true. We've seen that before too. That's exactly right. It is your business as the owner, and you need to take responsibility for it, meaning you have to understand what's going on in your business, mm -hmm. and you need to run your office manager. Right. 
That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So on that particular point, fully functioning office manager, Mm -hmm. right? Making sure that your team is properly educated. So what do I mean with that? Well, when you hire somebody, they need to be able to do their job. Sure. The better they do their job, the more production output they're going to have, Mm -hmm. right? The more new patients you're going to get, the more referrals, the better hygiene compliance, better sales, all the things that you expect a human being is going to have to do that, Mm -hmm. right? So you are responsible for making sure that that, 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 that team member is properly educated and trained to uh, to execute the duties that you are trying to get them to execute. Makes sense. So uh, t- staff training, making sure that you have the correct training materials, lineups, uh, manuals, uh, time set aside to do these things. Yeah, most people don't do that. That's correct. Uh, and again, not to, not to overwhelm them with downloads, I do have, I'll give them a link to the power program on yeah. here if people want to know for the office manager. And then with the uh, our online platform, we do a lot of staff training on DDS success. We'll also put a link in the uh, episode webpage. Correct. DDS success, we made our primary resource for getting the staff trained properly because really, it's so important. The basic positions, reception, there's positional training and stuff like that on there. That's exactly right. And then, you know, creating an environment that's pleasant to work in. And there's lots of pieces to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I'm not going to get into this too, too deeply. But the one thing I will mention is, listen, not everybody's right to work in your office. Right. It doesn't doesn't necessarily mean there's anything wrong with your office. It doesn't mean it necessarily mean there's anything wrong with this person. It just means it's a bad fit. They really should be doing something else. So really, everybody would be better served in that scenario if that person wasn't part of your team and you found somebody who's excited about being part of your team. Well, and that's what's interesting about that mm-hmm. is knowing whether somebody's a good fit for your practice or not, or business for that matter. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't have an organizational system in place, you don't have an executive running the place, mm-hmm. if the doctor is not uh, knowledgeable about how to run a business, uh, then you can't even detect if somebody's a bad fit. Correct, because it's totally based on opinion. Right. And, and I've seen cases where the OM is trained, like you mentioned, that model that does not work, the right. office manager being trained and educated mm-hmm. as an executive and manager and the doctor isn't, mm-hmm. uh, where the office manager realizes, okay, this person's a bad fit mm-hmm. and the doctor kind of uh, gives them pushback. Mm-hmm. But they're such a nice person. Yes. Yeah, it's like, yeah, but they've spent eight hours on the phone and haven't scheduled anybody, but they're really nice. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Correct. It's, it's kind of interesting how that works. Right. I mean, it really boils down to them being able to do the job effectively mm-hmm. and them being, uh, you know, a, a part of the team, mm-hmm. right? Meaning that they get along with their teammates. They have the ability to get along and both those things have to be present. Well, and, you know, I guess what's interesting about this too is right now I know staff issues are, a, they've always been a big deal. Right. They're a really big deal right now. Still, yes. I thought it would start to like level off a bit as the, the, the employment market started to kind of cool off a little bit. Yes. But it has not. Uh, I've still run into, you know, what you'll see on message boards or inquiries from new clients. It's still like, you know, this person wants this amount of money. This person wants this. I can't find a good this. Yeah. I guess the, the question is if anybody's out there listening and they're, they're in that boat, mm-hmm. they're, they're pretty convinced that it's hopeless. Mm-hmm. I, I, would you give them a positive message in a sense that it is possible to still build a decent team in their practice? Yeah, like absolutely. If you know what you're doing in that area, just like anything, mm-hmm. right, you can absolutely put together the right team. People are out there. I mean, take a look at the amount. If you think there's no people to hire, mm-hmm. go to the mall, go sit in the wall, mall for a second on one of those benches and go look at the sheer amount of people in your neighborhood. But, but don't make it weird when they're looking at the people. No. Yeah, just just look. There's lots of people. <laughs> that observe people, not one specific person. <laughs> or like don't. Don't stare at them. <laughs> you get the idea. There sure. isn't you. Like, there's nobody to hire. Of course, right? Okay, so you may have to be more creative mm-hmm. about the way that you find these people, right? You, it might not be as easy as just throwing an ad out there, and sure. then you have hundreds of applicants. That's not the time that you're in right this very second. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you might have to get more creative. Um, but yeah, absolutely, the right teams out there for you. Now, and as far as last thing I wanted to ask you about this, because mm-hmm. I know wages come up as a big thing right yes. now. And, you know, there's different viewpoints on wages because mm-hmm. you could go, you know, so-and-so wants this, you know, you hear, when you started hearing about hygienists wanting 65 or 69 to $75 an mm-hmm. hour or dental assistants who – I'm not saying that's a bad thing, Mm -hmm. but I'm saying like they used to get 42, Mm -hmm. right? Just these astronomical increases in wages. And, you know, because I've been asked about this, you probably have as well. And I had a bit of a a thought on this in the sense that, you know, some some folks are looking at like, you know, if you look at it from an employer's perspective, it's, you know, these staff want all this money. Yeah. From a staff's perspective, you know, sure, in some cases, like I have no problem paying somebody if they're 
producing it. Absolutely. Right? But from a staff perspective, they're being squeezed just as hard as the offices. That's exactly right. So the, the normal reaction to that would be to increase fees like everybody else is doing. That's the I, that's the point I wanted to get around to. Cause yeah. Y- yeah, that, that's the problem. Yeah. So if I'm not increasing my fees, I'm still married to tons of PPOs. You can't increase wages. Right. You're going to get priced out of the market. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's so exactly right. this is a wake-up call. Right. And regardless of how great this person is, they mm-hmm. are going to work for a paycheck. And they don't know you from Adam, even if they do think you're going to be a really good fit for them and they want to work for you. Mm -hmm. There might be somebody else that's also a really nice guy. And if they're paying five bucks an hour more than you are, they're going to go there. Yeah, they have to survive. That's exactly right. This is what we found with with hiring our, our, uh, I know I'm digressing here. No, please. Our starting salaries as we were bringing people in had to go up by, I think it was like 30 something percent. Correct. Just to, you know, in the last two and a half Just years. Just to stay competitive. Stay, right. Otherwise, you can't hire anybody. That's exactly right. And, you know, that's not a big deal. Um, everybody's earning more, but then we raised our fees. Well, yeah. Like you're you supposed to. to do. You have to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So I got my last two points here for you. Easy points. On our cheat sheet. Easy uh, points. Okay. So we got next point is sales. And you've yes. talked about sales a little bit. Right. I, I bring it up here and there because ultimately what drives income is sales mm-hmm. in a business. All right. So treatment acceptance might be the other word people would use. Correct. For this. That's a pretty way of saying sales. Sure. Now, what about sales? Because obviously we've done multiple episodes on sales. Yeah. But so if I'm, I'm sitting here listening to this, mm-hmm. uh, what am I going to dig into with regards to sales? What am I going to focus on to make sure that, yeah, my practice is recession worthy? Okay. So two, a couple of things about this. Um, boils down to one, you need to be able to close. And when I say you, I'm talking about the doctor, not your staff. Close. Close, meaning close means you have the money in your hand. So the doctor is taking the money. Well, no, that doesn't necessarily mean- They have a treatment coordinator there. Yeah. 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 Right. But they have to be able to get the patient up to the point of paying the money. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing that. They just have to be able- to do that. They have to have that skill set. That's exactly right. So, be, so that if your staff member suddenly goes skiing and breaks their legs, God forbid, mm-hmm. right? You 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 are not suddenly, your your entire revenue in your practice is interrupted because you don't know how to do this, sure. right? Sales is what drives income in mm-hmm. any business. Sure. And regardless of what name you want to give sales, treatment acceptance or patient well, compliance. And I won't or, get into the whole why, so, you know, some people consider sales, uh, like Greg, Dr. Winterack used to... He had a great article, sales. People think sales is a four-letter word. Right. But it's really not. It was kind of a funny <laughs> pun. But, uh, you know, the the uh, there's nothing wrong with getting somebody to accept something they need. Not at it's all. It's actually kind of cool. Well, you know, the bottom line is, is you as a doctor can't help get the patient healthy unless they accept the treatment. Sure. Which means they buy the treatment, which means you sold them the treatment. That makes sense. Right? So without sales, you're not going to help a lot of patients. Okay. Fair enough. Um. And nobody wins in that scenario. Your business doesn't win, but your patients certainly aren't thriving either. Right. Right. So um, the doctor has to be able to sell. It doesn't matter if they have treatment coordinators or a front desk person or an office manager that's also really good at it. They have to have that skill set themselves. Mm-hmm. Right. So the ability to sell and enough to sell. Enough to sell, meaning yeah, I, people who need some to buy something. Correct. If I need to, um, you know, produce ten thousand dollars a day, I'm just picked a number out of the air. Sure. Um, okay. Well, I can't produce that unless I sell ten thousand dollars worth of treatment mm-hmm. each day, whether that treatment is scheduled to be done on that day or not. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I need ten thousand dollars worth of treatment to sell. So that you you need to have patients who have that need for treatment in front of you, either in what, hygiene or new patients? Correct. So that's where we go back to those prior points. We need new patients, right? But the, our, our main source of revenue should be your hygiene patients. Patients of record. Correct. Patients of record. So that's why you need high, high hygiene compliance. Because if you don't have high hygiene compliance, the only patients in your hygiene end up being your very compliant patients, which have already done all their treatment because by, by, they are compliant. Right. <laughs> Right? They were your top 20%. They're easy to sell. Well, this is where you'll see a practice where the doctor has been practicing for, I don't know, 12 years. Yes. They have 5,000 charts, one hygienist four days a week. 
Right. And they, they complain that all their patients have already done all their treatments. No, they're only, they haven't. They're only seeing 20% of their patient base. That's exactly yeah. right. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah. now they become new patient dependent. Mm-hmm. So yeah, obviously you, uh, you need to have enough to sell mm-hmm. um, as part of that point. So you need to make sure that your hygiene's healthy. You need to make sure that you're getting new patients. Makes sense. Um, and you need to have the ability to close those patients once they show up in front of you, not your staff you. Right. Okay, cool. All right. Which gets us to our last point. And we just did actually, before I mention what it is, we just did a couple episodes on this, Yeah. but uh, it's managing overhead. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, I mean, that's an obvious statement. You can't spend more money than you actually have. Sure. Right. But where overhead ordinarily goes off the rails, and I don't want to get too deeply into this because you really cover this in these episodes. Right. But, um, where overhead goes off the rails is uh, those little expenses mm-hmm. that add up that weren't planned for, like, ah, oh, it's just $100 here, sure. $100 there, and before you know it, you have no profit left. Um, or making financial decisions without knowing what your overhead is, like who are you hiring? Like, uh, do you need that piece of equipment and things like that? And then the other part of managing your overhead is not committing to other financial obligations without you being really sure, A, does this fall within my overhead percentages? And B, am I going to be able to recoup financially on this investment I'm making? And the example you give a lot that we see a lot is the uh, example of getting a um, CERIC. Okay. Right? We we, uh, we see s- people do it with a cone beam too. Yeah. The people are buying these things, which are good things to have. I'm not saying you shouldn't have them, but you just are not in a position where you're going to uh, make money out of that right, right. now. And those things are going to throw your overhead out of control. Well, and it was funny what woke me up to that yeah. years back. I keep, not that I don't like Zurich. I think it's a cool machine. No, no, no. I'm not it's picking great, on it's a, a great, it's a great machine. The, the problem was we were seeing these newer clients come in who had Zurich. And when you did the lease payment math yeah. against what they actually were spending in lab fees. Yeah. Prior to buying it, they were spending more on the Zurich than they'd been spending in lab fees and it also required their labor. That's correct. So that's where you go, okay, well, is this really the right thing to buy? That's exactly right. Yeah. Right. So when when I say managing overhead, I'm not just talking about controlling your spending. Sure. Right. I'm also talking about those new obligations, whatever you're putting money into. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a staff member or a piece of equipment or that that space next door, whatever it is that you're putting money, marketing, whatever you're putting money into must have that return that you're looking for. And that's part of managing overhead. Well, and part of, I think, in a recessionary environment or if you're concerned about economic uncertainty. Yeah. And this was something that you really drove hard during the whole COVID evolution. Yeah. I don't know if you recall this. You you really hit on two points, which I thought were great. Mm-hmm. One was eliminate all waste. Yes. So if you're spending money on something that you absolutely don't need, yes. get rid of it if you can. Yes. Because you know, there, there are people doing that, yes. right? And sometimes it's an obvious expense. Sometimes it's not. Yeah. But then the other side of it is if you're spending money on something, so let's say you're analyzing, should I keep this yeah. or should I dump it? Yeah. You have to look at well, am I just not using it? Yeah. Am I not using it? So, you know, someone might have a piece of equipment or something that they bought or some marketing thing they're doing that could be used yeah. to, to gain some benefit for the practice, but they're not really utilizing it at all. Right. And we see this with marketing a lot. The phone calls are coming in. They're just not converting them on sure. the front desk because they haven't trained their front desk properly. Well, and someone might go, well, what does that have to do with overhead? It has everything to do with overhead. Yes. You know, if, if you're paying a receptionist X amount, you're paying Y amount for marketing and you're not maximizing your receptionist and this marketing's producing and getting you leads, then you're wasting money. That's exactly right. Yeah. So it's eliminating waste, but that doesn't mean just chop expenses out. No. You have to look at that expense and go, could this actually have a benefit to my business? And a lot of them actually do. Sure. It's just you're not planning on how to use it. Again, that boils down to having a good office manager and you really wearing your hat on the financial control of the practice and utilization of the resources that you have already paid for. Right. Like your patients. Right. Yeah. Like that's what we're saying. Maximize hygiene. You've already paid for these patients. I think the big overriding theme is like eliminating waste. Right. Eliminate waste, utilize things. I guess it's saying the same thing. Yes. Utilize wa- eliminate waste and utilize things to the, the max. That's exactly right. And and so I've been asked a lot on this overhead issue, how often should I review it 
Yeah. You know, um, and you know, the normal was, you know, review it once a quarter or if you add a big expense. Yes. I mean, the first thing they should do is really dive into their overhead and, and figure out like, what should I get rid of? Yes. Right. And what or, do I need to use? Right. What right. do I need to use? Right. Because, you know, what I see sometimes, I'm just going to say one thing. And I'm hopping right in here. Well, it's, right. You're in, I'm interviewing you. So right. So, <laughs> you know, <I'm> <laughs> you can hop in all you want. Like, um, you know, like, what can I get rid of? Well, I can get rid of these staff and I can get rid of this marketing. And I'm like, are you like, no, you're not thinking right, <laughs> right? That's not what you need to be doing right now. You need to use these things. You right. can't get rid of your marketing ever. You can't get rid of, you need staff. I mean, they could always change the marketing channel to a more effective channel if marketing's not getting them anything. Absolutely. But if, but is mar, is your marketing not getting anything or is your front desk not converting right. those right. calls? I mean, you really have to look into this I mean, before you just get rid of it. You're pretty dead on with this. Yeah. The, the only time, I mean, the example, most ridiculous expense I ever saw. Yeah. And I don't know if you remember this. This is an oral surgeon client. Yeah. And he was talking to one of our power client managers and he was having overhead problems. Yeah. And his office was spending $10,000 a month on uh, flowers, fresh flowers. Yes. Okay. I do remember that. I'm sure it was beautiful. Probably yes. smelled great. Yes. So our power client manager told him, well, just stop that and buy some silk flowers or something and, you know, get on with it. You're yes. not taking home, you're, you're not, you're not taking home enough profit to pay your bills at home. Right. So he did and it all turned out fine. So there's, there's obvious ridiculous expenses, but I think you're spot on in that the culprit a lot of the time is not that you're spending just too much on something you don't need. It's usually you're doing things, you're not using what you have. Are you running your staff? Like not, do I have too much staff? No, no. Are you utilizing these people to get the hygiene compliance you want, to get the people with outstanding treatment back on the hygiene schedule, to talk to those patients and go, who do you have in your house that currently doesn't have a dentist? Good, let's get them scheduled, sure. right? The things you've already paid for, use them. Right, and, that's, and that does reflect back to overhead. Yeah. But to answer that last point, when I was being asked how often I should check it out, Yeah. you know, when you add a new expense or once a quarter, you can look at it more frequently after you've dived in and eliminated the waste. Yeah. Um, you could look at it once a month, especially if there's continuous inflation. Yeah. I would definitely keep an eye on things. A little bit more frequently. Just well, increases the frequency. Yeah, exactly. Because what you need during times like this is more control. Right. That so that sense. means you have to check it more often yeah, no. than you used to. Right? So those were all the points. I don't have any other ones. Now, what's interesting about what you mentioned here, obviously, so these are the points to be more resilient in a recession. But we do have that recession proofing checklist that yeah. you can download. I definitely recommend you check that out. That's yeah. really put together. Uh, but these are things, truthfully, if I did all these things and I really maximized all these things, this is great just to do in any event. Right. I mean, and you just actually hit the nail on the head, mm -hmm. right? These are the basics right. that should be in place regardless, that if you have these things in place, you have a healthy practice. Right. And you gave an example earlier about like the health of a human being, right? Like if I am in I, I did that off, off mic though. Yeah, you did it off mic, but I actually thought as you and I were talking that it was a great example. Sure, if they eat well, if they're in good shape, they're going to be more resilient to, you know, the 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 stresses of life and somebody who's, you know, eating Doritos and garbage all the time. Right. If somebody's really healthy and they're really stressed out, they're probably going to come through that stress much easier than if you have already beaten up your body by eating Doritos and things like that. Right. You I know? Doritos is going to be mad at us now. I do like Doritos. I, I, I recommend Doritos. <laughs> there you go. They just can't be a major part of your diet. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, Sabri, yes. this was awesome. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Thank you. Yeah. And um, that about wraps us up, folks. That's all we have. Uh, if you want to find out more about MGE, you can find us online at mgeonline.com or call us at 800-640-1140. Uh, the downloads, every, all the downloads we mentioned will be on the downloads page if you want to check those out. If you like this episode, you'd want to hear more like it, don't forget to subscribe to or follow us depending on the podcast platform that you're listening to us on. Folks, have a great week. We'll see you at next week's episode.